you hear me now? Okay. I'm uh, Lee McKnight of uh, Syracuse University and the Internet Governance Project. I'll be moderating our uh, workshop on the role and mandate of the IGF this morning. I'm pleased to have with me uh, Ms. Olga Cavili, Advisor for Technology, Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Argentina, Parminder from IT for Change, who uh, needs no further introduction, uh, Bob Pepper of Cisco, and previously uh, had a long and distinguished career with the Federal Communications Commission, Jeremy Malcolm of Consumers International and very fresh PhD, and Mr. Bill Graham of the Internet Society. Uh, without further ado, I'll uh, turn the program over to Olga to make her opening remarks, which will be brief. Uh, we will ensure that there is plenty of time for discussion in spite of our somewhat late start. Olga? Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. And uh, thank you to the organizers for inviting me. I would like to start by reminding you that Argentina was one of the countries that proposed the creation of a forum to discuss the internet governance issues. So we as, as a governmental representative uh, are totally committed to the IGF. And since then, we have been involved in the process and I think that in general, globally speaking, the the, the greatest achievement has been the multi-stakeholder approach and the multi-stakeholder model that we are all enjoying during these days. We are all together discussing. I'm really impressed about the open sessions in the afternoon. That was an idea that we had in, in the MAC and it really impresses me because it's, it's really an open dialogue where all the stakeholders can talk to each other, can agree, can disagree. We can even talk with people from abroad. We have set some remote participation hubs, so we had some participation from Argentina and from other countries, which makes me very happy because it's sometimes it's expensive to, to come and participate in the IGF. So uh, I would like also to, to, to tell you what happened in the local and in the regional aspect. Uh, regionally, we, we got very much engaged in the development of, of a regional plan of action for information society called ELAC. Now it's called ELAC 2010, where Argentina proposed the creation of an internet governance working group, where we are leading it. I'm personally leading it. And the idea is to bring more awareness of internet governance in the region, because our region is, you may look at the statistics, of presence in the IGF is the less represented uh, region in the world. Even in Brazil, um, if you take out the Brazilians from the amount of people that was there, it was only 6% from the Latin American region. So we want more people get involved in the process. We are working locally very much in capacity building programs. Uh, there has been also very interesting um, regional meetings, especially uh, arranged by LACNIC, which is our regional R uh, RAR, and by APC and by, by RITS, which are two uh, NGOs uh, with very strong presence in the region and very active. And. Um, I, I don't know how much time I have. I could go for a while, but I think my, my, my main remarks are that many things happen in, in the national and the local uh, and in the regional uh, aspects. Also, locally, after Tunis, after we presented the, the IGF idea, the forum idea, uh, our minister uh, created a special area where I, where I work, where I work as an advisor, uh, specially devoted to follow all the WISIS outcomes, process, and IGF and ICANN meetings. Uh, also, I, uh, some of us, two of us, uh, came with the idea that we had to help training the diplomats. So we created a special professorship about technology for diplomats, which has been really a success. And I, I've been, it's, I have realized that it's really a pioneering uh, idea. And we have been doing that for three years after WISIS. So I would stop here, and um, I would welcome comments or questions from the floor or from you. Thank you. Uh, just to clarify, the way I propose to proceed is uh, that the speakers make their remarks briefly and then we'll have a, a brief uh, chance for them to respond and then we'll open the floor quickly to all of you to make this a very interactive dialogue as uh, some of you know that's my style here. Thanks.
Thank you, Lee. Uh, uh, I think uh, it's time. We have been into this for three years now, and uh, a lot of people are thinking that we should get into some kind of a serious thinking about why was IGF created, where are we going uh, now. The basics have been established. IGF is here to stay, and I don't really see a real danger of it disappearing in 2010. Uh, given that the institution has been established, the rough contours of the institution are already there. I need, we need to start seeing the purposefulness of it. It's like the house has been built, and now let's see what are we going to do about it. Uh, as Mr. Desai said about the parents of people who are asking questions. So I, I think the going back and not just celebrating that we are doing great and things are fine and people meet and they travel and obviously everywhere you go you meet people and uh, then there's something coming out of it so let's be happy about it. I think this was not really the purpose for which IGF was created and we should go back to why it was created and see what we are doing about it and I know it's not something which you can achieve immediately but are the directions right. So uh, I think there were two, if you read the Tunis uh, agenda, the two parts of the mandate. One is a public policy function, and other is a capacity building function. But there's a clear hierarchy between the two. The public policy functions are one to three, or one to four, and the rest, three, four, f six, four, seven, seven, eight, are, are capacity building functions. It is, the announcing paragraph says, it's a public policy dialogue forum. So when I say public policy function does not mean making public policy, I'm very clear about it. It's not supposed to make public policy, but contribute to public policy. It's an institution of deliberative democracy where people discuss, shape ideas, make them ready uh, for institutions which should make public policy uh, to be consumed. And are we doing it at all? And I have grave doubts that uh, we, we are doing anything. As for mere capacity building, I think there are many organizations which do it. For example, I was at GigaNet, which is not part of the IGF. It was probably even a better place to exchange information than many of the workshops here. So what's the difference between a UN body? There's a certain legitimacy, certain convergent political uh, legitimacy of a UN body where the public policy functions become more important than mere exchange of information. And we, sh we should utilize this platform to see where can uh, we go ahead on this. Uh, but I must also say that to go ahead on this purpose, we should have a belief in public policy, first of all. And I, I have some concerns about the kind of uh, discredit public policy and democratic, uh, democratic uh, governance often gets falls into in this area, especially which is often uh, shown to be a uh, uh, technical area or a market-oriented uh, one. I would now uh, try to propose some changes or some, some improvements in the IGF which can take it forward. I'm concerned about the participation in the IGF and even the participation of people who are actually sitting with the laptops in most of the halls. And if you really need to fill these uh, corridors and halls, it's very easy. You get the right topics. People have very con burning topics on internet governance issues, which are not discussed here mostly. There was an open letter given by more than 100 organizations and individuals to the IGF uh, yesterday, which listed some of the questions which are on people's minds. People would have different interpretation of questions, but I think there are big questions, and if you pull them here, people will follow. And that's the only way to make people come here. Otherwise, it will be a business interaction meetings, and that does some, serve some purpose, but doesn't serve the purpose of um, the disadvantage sections, which uh, is the section to which much of the text office is, is devoted. I think we are stuck at present in the logjam on public policy internationally on a very institution-centric approach. The most of the issues are about, is ICANN right? Is ITU right? Is IGF the right body to do these things? Uh, or is the US government right? Or it should be multilateral? And, and we are making no progress uh, at all. And one way to go ahead where IGF has a great role is to change from an institution-centric approach to an issue-centric approach where we start precipitating the important issues which are on people's mind. There may be different views on uh, those issues, but the importance of the issue can be mutually agreed. It's much easier to agree on the importance of an issue. It's possible for a forum like IGF to agree on the importance of an issue. And we do a lot of work to precipitate that issue write backgrounders on it, like WIGIG, uh, the working group on internet governance did, and come out with alternative positions on it, come out with the kind of institutions which seem to have a direct role in making a public policy in that area. 
and with certain level of maturity around that issue, maturity of a discussion, debate, and backgrounds around the issue, hand it over to the identified issue for what would be then enhanced cooperation among those uh, institutions. And the only reason this may not be done, people would say, is that we don't have the resources to devote to this kind of an activity. And then we are then, uh, then uh, that represents a disbelief in our political processes because they are important issues and we need to be able to devote resources to take up uh, this kind of approach within uh, IGF. And that would, I think, make IGF meaningful without any way going into a public policy making function. Thank you. Hmm. Thank you, Parminder. Uh, Bob? Thank you. Um, I'll wait and comment on Parminder's suggestions. I think they're great, um, and I'll to try to tie that back. What I wanted to do, though, is start with, um, you know, so actually, what have we been able to achieve so far uh, in IGF, and has it sort of met, not met, or in some cases, I believe, uh, exceeded expectations? Um, you know, Parminder was very quick to say, well, those of us who are here feel good about it, that's okay, let's get beyond that. I actually think that um, it, it's important to pause for a second and, and state why we feel good about it and then move on because that will help frame what we can do going forward. Uh, Olga's point about the multi-stakeholder approach working, I think actually cannot be under uh, or overemphasized. I mean, this to me is the key and core success so far. Uh, of, of IGF. I know of no other forum that actually works where you can have uh, academics, civil society, business, and government talk to each other in informal, flexible ways that don't have a highly structured agenda um, where you can actually talk to people and they're listening, they're not talking at you because of some, you know, preconceived position that they have to take. Um, somebody yesterday, I thought, said it very well, right? As you might imagine from, uh, you know, three years ago, or, you know, in, it, uh, going back to, uh, to Tunis, at that point I was sort of wearing a government hat. Um, but at the time, if you recall, business was very nervous about IGF. You know, what is this going to mean? Well, I can tell you now, having been at Cisco and working with the, the entire business community, somebody said yesterday, you know, fear is declining or gone. Engagement is growing. People actually are talking to each other, right? Finding common ground on issues, on the substance of the issues. And this is where I think that what Parminder has said cannot also be um, uh, overstated. Uh, we still have, I think, too much discussion at the meta level or the institutional level or talking about process. Um, I think there's huge, we can talk about later, huge advantages moving forward and moving issues forward collaboratively together. And some of the concrete benefits that have come out of this have been the regional and national uh, meetings creating a fabric coming out of IGF which is not just an annual meeting. Because if that's all it is, Right? It's a lost opportunity. At the national level, there are multi-stakeholder meetings and dialogues on an ongoing basis in the UK, Germany, France, um, Latin America. Um, there's, gonna, you know, there's even work that we're going to hear more about, uh, I think, later today going forward um, in Africa and, uh, for West Africa, I'm sorry, East Africa and Kenya. Um, certainly hope to see more of that, and I actually would uh, hope that we would see much more of that as we prepare for Egypt next year. Um, these events are building greater exchanges between policymakers, business, and civil society outside of here, outside, beyond IGF, and I think uh, moving to you know, Parminder's point about issues. Um, it, it is about capacity building both in terms of individuals as well as uh, nations. Uh, it, you know, one of my um, uh, little you know, frustrations with uh, this week has been the theme is you know, uh, you know, essentially internet for all. Um, there's a lot that can be done on sharing best practices. Uh, people can take home. How do we be able, how can we be able to uh, extend the internet and broadband everywhere? Um, 
and yet, you know, we've had some of that, but I don't think there's been enough of that. That those things are very, very concrete. How do we um, enable uh, participation on the demand side with applications and use? We've had some great exchanges on um, uh, multilingual uh, access uh, to internet, local content, local language. Some very concrete things came out of last year on uh, local language that people actually are developing products and services based upon that to extend internet access um, uh, to um, uh, people um, across the globe in local languages. Uh, earlier, um, you know, just uh, as we're waiting to come up here, somebody pointed out that, you know, three years ago in Athens, one of the hot issues was uh, some of the human rights questions. Well, what came out of that? Some very concrete things with, uh, is it the WNI uh, the initiative that, I'm sorry, the, G the GNI, um, the global uh, uh, network initiative uh, that came out of that, very concrete, addressing some of these questions. Um, you know, that would not have happened. Uh, the other advantage of uh, the IGF without having a sort of lockdown agenda in the MAG is terribly important because it's dynamic, it's open, and it's flexible. Right? So if you look at a lot of the issues that are emerging on t this year's agenda as we begin to think about next year's, you know, three years ago, if you go back to, to Tunis or you go back to Athens, environmental issues, green issues, uh, sustainability issues really were not top of mind. Those are now actually top of mind issues that are terribly important. And again, information sharing uh, across regions, I think, is enormously beneficial. But I can also tell you it's enormously beneficial to hear from people in other sectors. The multi-stakeholder approach works. And I think we just need more of that more generally. Um, having been formerly in government and Olga's currently in government, I think you know, we would both you know, say that uh, you know, not all of the best ideas reside in government. Um, and what we need to hear are sort of bubbling up ideas. Uh, and it's the same thing for business. So thanks, and we'll do more discussion. Uh, Jeremy? Thanks very much. Um, I'm going to deliver a slightly more critical perspective than what we've heard so far. Um, my organisation, Consumer International, represents um, over 220 consumer associations throughout the world, and therefore it's a segment of the larger stakeholder group that we know as civil society. And civil society is an extraordinarily diverse group um, because really its only defining criteria is that it doesn't include governments or the private sector. In fact, it's so broad that in the IGF we've taken to carving out the internet technical community uh, from the civil society and private sector groups and into its own stakeholder group. But what we're left with in civil society is a group that includes academics, um, activists and ordinary consumers, amongst others. Yet despite this diversity, it is possible to generalise in saying that of all the stakeholder groups, civil society is the least likely to consider that the IGF has fulfilled its mandate from the Tunis Agenda. I'm going to propose uh, to spend a few minutes discussing why this is. Part of the reason is that it was largely civil society that developed the idea for an internet governance forum within the working group on internet governance. In fact, much of the IGF's mandate in the Tunis Agenda comes straight out of the working group's report, including the paragraph about identifying emerging issues, bringing them to the attention of the appropriate bodies and making recommendations. So the Internet Governance Caucus, in fact, which has co-organised this workshop, was one of the strong supporters of the working group's proposal, and it, it published a response in which it suggested that the IGF would be empowered to develop soft law instruments, such as recommendations, guidelines and declarations. So when the World Summit on the Information Society accepted the working group's recommendations over the objections initially of the private sector and the internet technical community, and not to mention the US government, civil society naturally believed that it had scored a surprising win. You know, granted that it was the product of a political compromise with um, the US government over um, oversight of ICANN, even so, what we believed we had achieved was the establishment of a soft policy-making forum in which civil society could participate on an equal footing to government and business. So three years later, with the IGF more than halfway through its initial term, what we appear to have ended up with is not a policy development forum of any kind, soft or hard, but simply an annual conference. It's natural then that some members of civil society feel that a bait and switch has been pulled, because this is not what we bargained for. 
It certainly doesn't place civil society on an equal footing to the powerful governments and business interests who currently dominate internet government, the internet governance regime, and who are therefore quite adamant that the IGF should not disturb the status quo. Bob Pepper gave the example of um, the Global Network Initiative as a concrete outcome that shows the multi-stakeholder process works and has, has produced um, uh, some concrete tangible results in which all the stakeholders are involved. But in fact the GNI isn't a good example of multi-stakeholderism because it's not multi-stakeholder. I'm not complaining that it doesn't include civil society because it does, but it doesn't include governments. Now why should I be concerned about that as a civil society person? Simply because governments will not buy into its outputs. We need to have fully multi-stakeholder um, decision-making in which all parties are involved in order to um, create lasting and productive outcomes from internet governance. So uh, there is good reason to think that civil society has got its work cut out for it in trying to make any meaningful changes to the internet governance forum. Uh, in one sense, it's easy to blame the Secretariat and the multi-stakeholder advisory group for developing structures and processes for the IGF that are ill-suited to the fulfilment of its mandate as a policy development body. But of course, the Secretariat and the MAG are themselves products of a, a larger political and economic system that will naturally resist any redistribution of power over internet governance. So what are civil society activists to do? We could concentrate on cha changing the larger political and economic system, as in part the American people began to do on the 4th of November, and as civil society has been doing on many other fronts uh, for years, such as advocating for reforms within uh, WIPO and the WTO. But it seems to me that a more direct approach would be to develop proposals for reform to the IGF that will increase civil society's voice in policy making but without unduly challenging the existing authority of governments and the private sector. So how would we do this? Well I've explained one approach in a paper that I wrote for this year's IGF uh, meeting that's been distributed by the Internet Governance Project uh, and which was in turn very loosely and partially based on the conclusions of my doctoral thesis. Without going into too much detail about it, I'll, I'll endeavour to describe the basic proposal in just four simple points. First, the MAG needs to be made more representative and accountable by being appointed by the stakeholders themselves, perhaps through a randomly, nominated, uh, a randomly appointed nominating committee, as in the case of the IETF. The Secretariat, in turn, should be accountable to the MAG. Second, the IGF's plenary sessions need to allow for intensive multi-stakeholder deliberation on policy proposals that are normally developed by the grassroots dynamic coalitions and workshops. For this to work, the participants must be supplied with balanced briefing material, be divided up into small but diverse groups, and be assisted by facilitators to discuss the proposals in depth, with each participant treating the others as equals. Third, the output of these small group discussions should be brought back to the plenary forum for further discussion, at the conclusion of which the MAG will be in a position to document any consensus that may have emerged, and if appropriate, to begin to formalise it as a recommendation of the IGF. Finally, a recommendation may only be issued with the approval of each of the stakeholder groups represented within the MAG. This is key in order to diffuse the concerns of governments and business that the IGF will challenge their own authority. At the same time, it also increases the relative authority of civil society by giving it the same right of veto over the recommendations as the other groups. So to wrap up, some of us in civil society have been feeling for a while that particularly the plenary sessions of the IGF are a bit of a waste of time. And this November, the ITU's Secretary General said exactly that. Uh, leaving aside how disingenuous that may or may not be, it, it does show that the IGF's success is being questioned by others with more clout than civil society has, and that will bear on the outcome of the review that's being conducted before its five-year mandate ends. Now, we don't want the IGF to end, even in the state that it is now. It's, it's very valuable as it is. So my opinion is that the IGF's best hope for salvation is to go back and look afresh at the reasons for which its establishment was proposed by the Working Group on Internet Governance in the first place. If it can recapture that original vision, then in my view the IGF should have a long and fruitful future ahead of it. Thank you, Jeremy. Bill? Thanks very much. Um, 
Uh, just a few thoughts here because uh, being last, much of what I might want to say is already on the table, so uh, I'd rather we get to the discussion relatively soon. Uh, I think one of the important things about this IGF is uh, that we've now touched on almost all of the most sensitive, almost taboo topics that uh, developed in the WISIS, and nobody has died, which uh, I think is real progress for the IGF and says a lot for, for the way it works. How long should it continue? That, to my mind, is a really good question, and, and the jury is still out to a certain extent, although uh, ISOC certainly is a strong supporter of the IGF and will continue to be as long as it continues to, uh, to evolve in a, a positive manner. I think one of, the, one of the other really important things that's happening here is the uh, development of local, national, and regional IGFs, and Bob already pointed to a few. I had the honor of being at the East Africa IGF uh, myself, and got to see that, in fact, that uh, that really did turn out to be a multi-stakeholder forum at the uh, national and, re and regional levels. Uh, there were very high officials from government there. There were certainly business. There was certainly a lot of civil society. And uh, the, the discussions were really very fruitful. Um, there was a good focus on development, certainly, but there was also an appropriate focus on governance mechanisms and policies and what needs to be changed in those two realms. So to my mind, it looked more like uh, the IGF that was described in the Tunis agenda possibly than, than the annual global one. And I think that's, uh, that's something that needs to be fostered and uh, continued. As for the main IGF, and in fact this will become more critical, I think, as, as we see national and uh, regional IGFs developing, uh, the issue is funding. Um, the Secretariat has done a tremendous job at uh, keeping the IGF going. Uh, they've been helped or hindered to various degrees by those of us on the, uh, the MAG. But the, the shortage of funds really is uh, a problem uh, going forward because as this, as this movement develops to talk about this at the, at the local and national reg uh, regional levels, uh, it is going to require some resources and we need to find a, a way to do that. But I wouldn't say that funding should come in the form of an annual budget allocation from the United Nations or, or some similar body. I really think that the non-traditional funding model we have now where uh, there is a remarkable mix of sources of funding is important because it provides the IGF with a feedback loop about its success. As long as the funding continues to grow, and it is growing, it means that stakeholders in the forum are seeing it as a success. What we need to do is broaden the, uh, the, the range of stakeholders who are funding the IGF at whatever level uh, to avoid capture by any one stakeholder group and uh, to, continue to make that a more vital uh, feedback loop. I also think that at, by the end of the third IGF, and we're very close to the end now, we probably have had enough uh, introductory sessions on various things. Uh, there, there will always be new attendees at every IGF, and there will be a need to do some basic capacity building, introduction to issues, and so on. But we need to think about uh, having also some more advanced sessions where, uh, where people get together and talk about things in a much more, uh, a, a much deeper level that's more likely to produce uh, useful information that to, uh, to inform and influence the policy process back at the national level. One of the things I'd like to suggest that's maybe a little radical is to avoid more, more of these soapbox sessions where we sit up here blinded by the lights, can't see you at all, and uh, you're sitting down there listening to us talk, essentially. And while we hope to get into some discussion, this just isn't realistic. Uh, if we're going to have real outputs in, in the forum that uh, Jeremy was talking about, for example, that really requires much more useful dialogue. There are logistical issues with sound and video recording and so on, which is important for the remote participants and also for uh, producing books uh, such as the IGF uh, provided us with yesterday, which are, is a very rich source. But we need to find a way of being more interactive, have more space for discussion, and, uh, and much less uh, a much smaller number of speeches, and with that, I'll stop speeching. Okay.
taking uh, Bill's cue. Uh, I'll just give uh, the panelists uh, one minute to uh, say anything briefly that they would like to say to follow up and respond to each other uh, before we open it to all of you. And I see several hands eager, ready to go, uh, but uh, is there anything burning from the panelists that, yes, Olga. Thank you, I would like to, to, to take Parmenter's uh, comment about improvements and I think that as Bill pointed out in, in the regional, I was not there unfortunately, I was invited but I couldn't go to Africa, um, but I saw it in Latin America, we had a strong focus on development but I haven't seen it in, in the big IGF. I, I really don't see, uh, as we had the, the idea of a cross-cutting theme for development, I really don't see it in the general discussions, I don't see it present in, in the main sessions. I even have, I, I'm surprised that many people uh, put figures about uh, penetration of services and a lot of things, and they just don't include Latin America. <laughs> Maybe the numbers are small, but they just skip the, some regions. I, I, I've noticed uh, intensely that our region is, is really missed. So um, I think that perhaps, and we discussed this yesterday in a, in a very interesting workshop, uh, I think development is, is something that could be uh, an improvement in, in, in the general IGF. Thank you. Um, I'll give you some numbers on Latin America because we're doing a lot of work on that. I, but I actually think uh, the, the, the phrase workshop is almost a misnomer because unfortunately of the physical structure. And I think as we look towards Egypt, if we actually want to have workshops, you wouldn't shine lights in the eyes of the people here. Um, we'd be able to see you better. So I hope they can turn the lights up in the room. Um, and in fact, we would be looking at things like development. And I'll give a very concrete example. Last year on the Going Forward panel, um, I raised the question of uh, how can you get more spectrum for wireless broadband um, as part of a transition from analog to digital television in order to extend the reach of broadband in rural areas, unserved areas, underserved areas. Um, it's the part of the access question. How do you uh, facilitate licensing, getting more licenses out there? How do you drive um, the, the, the reach of the platform? That's only half of the problem, right? Once it's there, it's getting people to use it, comfortable with it, having prices uh, low enough so people adopt, getting uh, devices out there this year, but now we have netbooks and net tops, which actually are reducing that. These are some very pragmatic things that are frankly not related to the kind of policy discussions that would lead to the sort of the soft policy debate, which is, these are not in conflict. These are mutually reinforcing. Um, it's a separate discussion. How do you actually get the internet to everybody? And there's some very pragmatic things that can be done. And so going forward, I think one of the values of IGF is actually to focus workshops on those kinds of very pragmatic things because that's what we want. We, everybody should be, in, it's an inclusive internet, right? It's not, and frankly, a lot of the issues are becoming less and less related to policy. I mean, they are, clearly. If you talk about spectrum, spectrum policy, how do you make it available? How do you get it out there? How do you do that quickly? Um, and so there clearly are, are, are issues, but I think it's, if we try to focus more pragmatically on solving problems together and solving those issues to get the internet out to everybody, I think that would be a, uh, sort of the next step. Parminder? Yeah, thank you, Lee. I would have, uh, I would have, uh, I would have uh, responded to the uh, suggestions for improvement of IGF which have come forward. Uh, but um, I think I have to first respond to an idea I just heard now, which is one of the most dangerous ideas I've ever, ever heard, that a funding mechanism should be used as a feedback uh, system for a public policy body. And I did say earlier that we, if we are to be an IGF, first we need to believe in public policy and public bodies. 
And I don't think, how can anybody think about financing being a feedback mechanism for keeping a public body alive? And I would like uh, ISOC or Bill to respond on what really is meant uh, by saying that funding should be considered as a feedback mechanism. I'm clearly and strongly for a publicly funded model for anything which is public. There is a big difference between a public body and a corporate, and I think it's time we start understanding that difference. There are actually rumors flying thick that there was at one point uh, by certain members from within the IGF a proposal to withdraw support, withdraw funding, not support. If some things are done or some things are not done, and I think it's extremely dangerous and I can give you the absolute uh, word that if IGF does not clearly come out and says that it would not use funding as a basis of deciding agenda, a big part or the large part of civil society would simply walk out of the IGF. Thank you. I think, Bill, uh, you've been challenged. Yes, absolutely. Um, I'm not suggesting that there should be no government funding for this by any means, or no public funding for this, uh, but I am suggesting that the funding needs to be multi-stakeholder. The entire IGF process, in my mind, and, and I'm not putting this forward as an official ISOC position, by the way. Uh, we haven't had any, any discussion about it. This is, this is my view. Um, I really feel that by engaging people at the level of providing resources, it really does tell us that, uh, that the job is being well done going forward. I do recall that uh, offer to withdraw funding if certain things were not done. Uh, there's a lot of emotional talk in this environment, as you very well know, Parminder, and people will say things that they uh, they later come to regret. The person who said that later came to regret it, and, and so I don't think it's too serious. You just pick up and move forward. But, you know, absolutely, the, the biggest funders of this at this point are governments providing public funds. There's, there's no question about that. And I think they are, they are probably the most concentrated source of funds among the stakeholders here. It's still a very small number of governments who are funding it, and I think that tells us that governments are not uh, as deeply engaged in this process as it should be. I w that was the point I was going to make uh, to start, is that one of the real weak areas with the IGF moving forward is the lack of participation and the lack of awareness by governments. Uh, we don't see a lot of developing country governments here. Partly that's an issue of resources. Partly it's an issue of those of us who are here from uh, from different countries, we probably are not doing as good a job as we could at going back home, telling our national governments how important this is, getting them engaged at the national level, and moving that up to the uh, the global level. Because I really feel, paradoxically, this was created. The IGF was created by the WISIS, by what was essentially an intergovernmental uh, statement, the Tunis Agenda. And yet, the strongest participation by far is from the civil society uh, and the uh, the business community. The governments are, are the much in the minority here. That's fine from the perspective of debate, but it doesn't, uh, it means that what we do here is not l as likely to be taken up uh, at the national level, level where the real power exists. So I think a responsibility we have to take on as participants is uh, bringing the message back Back from the IGF that there is value, there is value for governments, and you, as my government, should be participating here. Um, I'm also going to uh, make some comments on uh, Bill Graham's point about funding, which I actually agree with in part. I agree that funding is a problem. I don't think it's necessarily always the amount of funding, but it's how the funding's directed. Um, two nights ago we had uh, a very wonderful gala evening, um, which I'm sure most of you attended with lavish food, drink and entertainment. Um, but I personally would have been quite happy if, uh, if half of that funding had been directed away from food and entertainment and into improvement of the IGF's processes. And in particular, I think we can take a, uh, a leaf out of um, the book of some of the other internet governance institutions such as ICANN and the IATF um, who provide for a better set of processes throughout the year in between their annual meetings. Um, for example, ICANN has um, mailing lists that are automatically 
translated into multiple languages. They also have phone conferences in multiple languages uh, with, with translation. And this allows them to carry on a work program throughout the year. The IETF is also renowned for being able to produce many tangible outputs throughout the year without the need of all its participants uh, meeting together in person. So um, personally, I would like to see more fun less funding being directed to the annual meeting uh, and more funding being directed to the intersessional processes. Okay. We'll open the floor. Uh, please keep your comments very brief, or I'll cut you off. Before when you start, uh, do uh, introduce yourself and uh, get a microphone to Wolfgang right up front. Thank you very much. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, my name is Wolfgang Kleinwächter. I'm from the University of Aarhus and I was a member of the WIGIC. And with all respect, Jeremy, um, I think you misread the uh, WIGIC report if it comes to your interpretation what the WIGIC has proposed. I think in the WIGIC we had a clear distinction between the so-called forum function and the oversight function. Uh, the forum function was not to have a new body which drafts policy, but a body, you know, which inspires policy, which contributes to policy development and does not policy development as such. The other function was the oversight function. This was the idea more that, you know, in a process or in a model, we had four models, if you remember, that, you know, this would be a place for policy development, but governments could not agree, and they agreed this would be a process, and in the process they will develop uh, all kinds of hard or soft policy or whatever, because if it comes to instruments, this is negotiated by governments, and governments have enough places around the globe where they are sitting in various bodies and can draft documents. I think if you would uh, bring the function to draft instruments, that means to agree about language in the IGF, you would kill the IGF. Because it's exactly the, the, the fact that the IGF does not negotiate, which liberates the way of thinking, which gives people more space to express them freely, you know, and to say, okay, that's my contribution to the debate. And this contribution inspires then others to go home in their body where they have a mandate and then to draft policy, soft or hard policy. And here I see an interesting development within the IGF because the dynamic coalitions are not directly linked to the IGF. It's an outcome of the IGF. In your paper you proposed that it should be like an official recognized working group of the IGF. This would kill the dynamic coalitions. The dynamic coalitions are independent bodies inspired by the IGF, linked to the IGF, but the dynamic coalitions can work on documents, on recommendations. It's up to them. There are governments, private sector, civil society groups in a dynamic coalition. I'm in the Bill of Rights dynamic coalition. If there comes a Bill of Inter Internet rights out of this. This could be a soft policy document. This would be fine. So, but be very Thank careful so, with Wolfgang. this proposal. I Sorry, um, I, I went to too long. Okay. Uh, so, just while we're handing the microphone to the next speaker, just to open Wolfgang's mind and defend Jeremy, uh, the Caribbean Internet Forum, the granddaddy of all regional Internet Forum, created six years ago. So, uh, predating the IGF at the global level, has developed an internet governance uh, framework, has drafted documents. It can be done at a local Local and regional level, it, so I'm not. I'm saying it's it's a, a matter of choice whether that is a, appropriate or not at the global level. Uh, next speaker. Uh, thank you, George Papadatos, uh, representing the Greek government here uh, in a minority position, of course, as Bill Graham has said. Uh, and I want to come back briefly to uh, uh, the, some of the points that he has made. Uh, I agree fully that uh, there is uh, some kind of declining interest, in, uh, interest uh, regarding governments in this forum. Um, and I have some reasons for that, uh, which I have experienced personally. Uh, my involvement throughout the WISIS was to support actively, as a bureau member, the participation of NGOs and civil society in, 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 in very dramatic ways, the split sessions in, uh, in Tunis, uh, bypassing some of the rules and so forth. Then what I found out when the IGF was created is that the whole thing took the dimension of a Western movie. 
the bad guys were the governments and the good guys were all the others. So you are viewed with suspicion here when you are a member of a government because uh, you participate in fora that uh, decisions are made, that there are long negotiations. The UN has taken a completely different view. Uh, and and I, I, found, I found out that you know, most of the times, uh, governments are, are, not, are not all that welcome, yet the funding comes from governments, yet the decisions are made by governments, and if there is any policy uh, influence uh, of this body through ideas, it should be through the governments. Um, I, I agree that, uh, that uh, a lot of things have been done in, in academia that uh, and probably some ideas may come from there and influence policy. But um, uh, the, the other problem is that it's very difficult for uh, two or three people from governments here to evaluate fully what is going on because we have this fragmented workshops, main sessions. The reporting process can be very cumbersome. And I'm saying this, I'm making a report to my government. I try to give a full reflection of what's going on here, but it's very difficult to, to capture. So, uh, and, and I think that if this process is taken over completely, in the end, if governments lose interest, and you have NGOs, civil society, and private business, there are so many fora around the world that are, are not unique like this one. Here, you need to maintain the original balance, bring the governments back in, and, and continue to find more um, imaginative ways of working together. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. Just a point of clarification. Were you suggesting that a, a workshop summary report or uh, where something was needed to facilitate government uh, understanding or evaluation well, of the... Uh, I think that all of us should should think, uh, first of all, uh, Bill highlighted this as an issue. I have highlighted this as an issue in private conversations. And I think all of us should think collectively how the governments can come back in. Uh, it was mentioned that very few African governments uh, um, um, <clears throat> participate here. Uh, I, I also happened the other day to uh, uh, talk to a, a um, senior level of a major uh, software corporation and he had some doubts as to whether he was going to participate next year. Yeah. So, uh, so but I, we okay, have I didn't hear a specific uh, yeah. solution but I, yeah. we hear the, the problem so let's uh, pass the microphone Thank to you. the next speaker. Thank you. I'm going to give a possible solution so in return for that I'll take a little bit of time. I'm Guru from no, IT4J. Guru? I'm no, you're not going to take a little bit of time. A very little bit. Very little bit of time but I'll give you a solution nevertheless. I want to start by saying that I think the fact that IGF is a unique space in global governance, it's a multi-stakeholder body, anybody can come, I as a CS person can talk to governments, I think we appreciate that. But I think we should stop making that a SOP. And if you heard Mr. Tang speak at the open session yesterday afternoon, or you heard the government person from Brazil speak, I think many people are saying that it's very necessary that we protect the multi-stakeholder nature of the IGF. It's very important. But I think we, should, we have to move on. We have to start really engaging with issues. The IGF was not set up as a talk shop so that people would come in and have free food and free drink and free internet. But we have to figure out how do we help the process of public policy making, global public policy making, to create an inclusive, people-centered, development-oriented information society that Geneva principles. So what's your yeah. suggestion? Yeah. I knew you would wait for that so I could take my time for the preamble. Yeah. So I think uh, I would request speakers from... Nitin Desai spoke of two groups, and I think the first group predominantly would like the space to be a multi-stakeholder, and they think it's an end in, in itself. And people from the second group don't think it should be like that. So I would request people who are in this first group, nebulous group, to take note of that and stop only making that as the sole point that we should be happy about. Now to look at why governments don't come, I think the reason is simple. I'm, I'm from India, I'm from the developing world, and I can clearly see that this IGF space is a space dominated by certain sets of people, certain sets of interests, and it's much better than it was in VISIS. I read from the VISIS 2003-2005 and over the three IGFs, I can gradually see a change in the constitution of people coming here. But I think the problem still is one that we highlighted in a letter uh, that we wrote to the UN IGF. 108 institutions across the world signed that letter, and one of the crucial issues we identified in that is the one of democratic deficit. And the problem here is that 
it's exemplified by the theme of this particular IGF. We say internet for all, and then we say reaching the next billion. And that's a travesty because it, the whole issue of internet for all was based on UNESCO's Education for All 1990 Jomtien Conference. And when we said education for all, we said, how can we reach education to the last million or last billion? And there was a special focus on how policy making, policy measures, public investment could drive the process. That's exactly the opposite of what we are doing here. When you say next billion, cut the prices a bit, make sure that you deregulate a bit more, and then private sector will find the answers. But if you're looking at the last billion, you have to look at completely different set of processes, and governments will be interested in looking at the last billion, African governments, Asian governments, Latin American, that's what okay. Olga said. So your, your, su your specific suggestion was address the democratic deficit, is that it? Yeah, that's okay, it. Okay, thank you. And next sorry, sorry. No, 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 thank you. Uh, thank you. Next speaker. Thank you. It doesn't. Okay, thank you. Um, I'd like to comment um, on two aspects. First, the sense of the sense of threat that I see so often in the room, meaning if you don't do A, I won't come anymore. And it's not only something that civil society brings up, but governments and uh, private sector as well. And they all have specific ideas what has to be done to make them come again. And these things are not always the same. They are different. Um, what I would like to see instead is a sort of ownership for this process. Uh, and that would imply recognizing that people have different ideas about how the forum should evolve. Um, it should also develop an ownership for the experimental character of this forum. Those who have been here more often must have seen that the format of workshops and main sessions changes all the time because the MAC tries to pick up the criticism and uh, try to make it better. But it's always an experiment. Nobody knows whether it works out or not. And I miss some sort of acknowledgement of this openness for changing it and trying to improve the process. That's my first uh, um, comment. The second one has to do with this expectations that we see in the criticism and the expectation seems to be that processes uh, that work on the local level or in small communities must also work on the global level and I think that is an illusion. Processes that work in communities like the IETF that share the openness for this approach don't work at the governance forum because we are not all engineers. We don't share the same skills and the same work experience and cultural background. We are much more diverse. We need to develop different approaches. Also different approaches than those you would find on the national level. This cannot be a democratic entity because democracy as such is a national, uh, uh, national approach. Okay, and your specific suggestion, Jeanette? Yes. I think that workshops like the one APC organized uh, on participation with the goal to develop a code of practice, I think that is an outcome that is uh, suitable for things like the idea. Jeff, thank you. Uh, thank you. Let's just keep moving back. Yeah, my name is Ranjit Dwedi and I come from the World Health Organization India Country Office. Uh, just straight to the, the suggestion and solution. I thought, you know, one important way to focus the, 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 the work of the IGF and their deliberations, which also brings convergence in the work of the United Nations, is if you can if you can bring into the discussions something on the Millennium Development Goals, which the UN is emphasizing that they want to achieve worldwide, that would directly bring focus and specific ideas and actions, and, and if we measure as to how the IGF has contributed to the Millennium Development Goals over time, uh, I think we might make good headway. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker. Uh, okay. Uh, thank you.
Thank you. Uh, my name is Victor Hansen. I am a, a representative uh, of Brazil in the MAG. Uh, I, I work for the Brazilian Ministry of External Relations. And uh, well, as you know, Brazil is one of the countries that has been very active in the IJF. Uh, we have hosted the second meeting. Uh, I, I agree with what has been said here uh, concerning uh, uh, the democratic deficit of the, the IJF. And, and I must say that uh, we, we, we cannot have the illusion that we will find a way of creating a participative democracy uh, that is really global and that works at the global level. So I, I think the role of the IGF has been uh, to be a dialogue forum, uh, and I think it's, it has working well in this uh, regard. But I think. Uh, although I, I don't think we, we can think of the IGF as a decision-making body, the IGF, do, uh, the IGF really could do more. I think we could try to find ways to have recommendations from the IGF to other decision-making bodies, and I, I'll give you a very concrete example. Uh, we have presented here well, uh, a Brazilian experience and, uh, on uh, uh, child pornography uh, countering in the country with the collaboration of Google. Uh, at the domestic level. Um, child pornography has become a very, very uh, important issue in the IGF. Maybe in, in Tunis and in, in, in Geneva, no one would think this issue would get all this important. But the fact is, uh, no one would think that UNESCO, for ex that UNICEF, for example, should be involved in internet governance. But suddenly, maybe we have found reasons to send recommendations that could perhaps be sent by the IGF to bodies such as UNICEF in order to take care uh, uh, of this particular issue of internet governance. So I, I think uh, the next step should be finding ways to have recommendations issued from the IGF. IGF, uh, trying to make it more democratic, as democratic as it can be. We know it's limited as a democratic body. It wouldn't be uh, a, a decision-making body anyway, but uh, I think uh, if we, we are not able to, to, to get recommendations out of those forums, then uh, it will become a forum in which uh, those people we know will show those people, those uh, opinions we know on those issues uh, everybody has always debated. Uh, thank you. Thank Thank you. Uh, next speaker. So I heard uh, of the comments to get to the point of a specific suggestion or, or recommendation very briefly without preamble. Thank you. Next speaker. I actually have a question. Uh, first of all, it is very unfair to judge the IGF being after only three years, and especially in light of the fact that we're talking about the internet, w which has social, political, and legal implications. To me, a big challenge at this stage within this democratic process, which is uh, I don't even question it, is issues of legitimacy. And I would like to ask, because I think that the panel represents every single stakeholder group, whether currently as we speak there are channels of cooperation between civil society groups and the private sector, governments and civil society, to see exactly what it is uh, that we're trying, they are talking about and the formalization processes that they have in place. Thank you. I do have a question and the question is do we know in five years how the IGF will be measured? Do we know whether we have to go back to the UN and what will be measured on? My historical experience or current experience with the Caribbean Internet Forum, which was very much experimental and was near death through its first five years. Every year I was never sure whether, where the money would come from for the next year, uh, what would it continue. By the fifth year, by coincidence, it sort of gelled and is now a formal nonprofit institution going forward. So there is something, I don't know, by chance to this five-year lifespan that seems to maybe make sense. It takes about five years to figure out what the hell we're all doing here and why we're here and why should we come back and is there really deep ownership. So in, in terms of the formal process, um, there was to be a consultancy report that was not done perhaps for a lack of funding, uh, but there is a requirement that uh, formal evaluation begin, I guess, is it later this year? 
um, and run through uh, next year. Uh, so in very much, I, I view this present workshop as an important element or the first element in that evaluation and amongst ourselves representing or just randomly being from different stakeholder communities whether the IGF deserves to continue and if it does, how it will work. So it's an open question uh, formally whether it will or will not continue. Uh, the evaluation process really depends on all of us participating in the IGF, whether we think it should, as well as uh, the four more formal intergovernmental process that will make the final call. Uh, anyone else care to comment on that, okay. Bob? And, uh, per, per. Uh, technical uh, issue. Uh, around February, I think there would be a meeting uh, in Geneva, uh, which uh, is a normal consultation process which goes on every year, but probably there would be a day devoted to taking feedback from stakeholders uh, this year about uh, the desirability of the continuation of the forum and if there are any suggestions about how it should uh, continue. Uh, it's, it's around February and it's, uh, it will be the information would be available on the IGF website. Thank you. Bill? Thanks, yes, uh, speaking from the perspective of a MAG member, uh, Parliament is correct, the co there will be a consultation on the evaluation the last week of February in Geneva, uh, and I hope there's good facilities for uh, remote participation for that. Uh, the Marcus uh, Coomer has told us that the evaluation will probably be conducted by the United Nations Evaluation Unit, and uh, it will have to work through a series of UN committees, and the decision will ultimately be taken by the UN General Assembly. Just a, a short commercial break here. I think it's really critical that all the stakeholder groups uh, make it very, very clear that we need to be part of the evaluation and it not be just a simple study done by, uh, by uh, UN bureaucrats in New York. So one of the issues that kept coming up was uh, relevancy. Uh, and the question of how to get, um, uh, how can the IGF, either the annual meeting or even regional meetings, be more attractive to government? Um, and how can you proceed to actually have something that um, is pragmatic? Uh, I think that one way to think about that is the, on the issue side, right? Some of the issues that are discussed at the IGF are international and global issues. Right, and sort of global governance questions. There are a lot of issues that are discussed that frankly are, you think, can think of as comparative national. I mean, they're international because we're all here together, but when we talk about sort of comparatively, how do different countries approach and solve issues, these, some of these questions in their context, and then sharing that information, and very pragmatic. Sometimes it requires national you know, uh, you know, policy or intervention of a national regulator. Sometimes not. I think if we actually focus on some of these in a very pragmatic way on the comparative national implementations that they are, again, I like the sort of soft policy making. I mean, frankly, these are um, learning from one another and recommendations. What have other countries done in terms of...